Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining today's town hall, uh, which is on the IFLA General Assembly. And this is, in fact, our third town hall for this week. And, um, and just to let you know, this meeting is also being recorded. So joining me today is Sharon, uh, our IFLA Secretary General. Hi, Sharon. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. It's a little bit cold and chilly, um, but um, I'm, as some people know, I'm sort of celebrating one year in the post. So it's been a, an eventful year and a great year and looking forward to the next one. So good morning for me um, to everybody. Good morning and, uh, and congratulations on your 12 months as well. Um, we're also <laughs> welcome Martin Wade, who's our parliamentarian. Hi, Martin, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. It's another cold, wet day in Scotland, but uh, it's good to be here. So, hello, everybody. Fantastic. And of course, my name is Vicky McDonald, and it's my privilege to be the IFLA president. And today I'm joining you from Brisbane, uh, a beautiful winter's day at 19 degrees uh, at 5 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. So, um, thank you for joining today's um, town hall. If you've just joined us, of course, we do have interpretation available and the link is in the chat as well. So we might just move through um, and how we'll work today is we're really keen to maximise the opportunity to talk to you today about next, um, next Thursday's General Assembly. There is the opportunity to ask questions and we just ask if you can use the Q&A um, functionality at the bottom of the screen and what we'll do is look at those questions and respond to questions. Um, it's really important to ask questions if you're uncertain about what something means because that's really what today's session is really about, that opportunity to ask questions. And also remember if something not clear to you or doesn't make sense, it's probably the same for somebody else. So um, don't be shy, do ask the question as well. So if we look at the agenda and what we want to achieve today is a really round why we're having a briefing and it's really to equip you to be able to make a decision at next week's General Assembly. We'll also talk through some of the key agenda items that are on the General Assembly, including importantly the uh, status um, statute change for AMBI status, and Sharon will explain that to us. Uh, then Martin will take us through some of the other statute changes that are proposed. We'll explain how the meeting will be delivered in hybrid uh, functionality. And then, of course, there is the opportunity to ask questions and we'll provide answers to those questions as well. So that's really what we're doing. So um, as I've said, why, why are we having this briefing? We do have the General Assembly next Thursday, uh, the 20th of June. And the General Assembly is a really important governance milestone in any calendar year for the Federation. It is our highest governance uh, function and it allows it has some very key functions that it needs to um, undertake and they're listed on this screen and they relate to Article 8.1 in our statutes. The statutes are available on the IFLA website for you to look at at any time. So we have statutes and rules of procedure. But the General Assembly and how it is, operates and, and its purpose is uh, defined in Article 8.1. And the General Assembly, as I said, is our highest governance decision-making uh, level. And it ha its purpose is to determine the purpose and values of the Federation to amend statutes, to determine the conditions of membership of the Federation and importantly, to receive and approve the financial report and accounts. So these are the sort of functions that will happen any year in a General Assembly. For this year, and what that means in plain English is that it's an opportunity as well for us to celebrate uh, our work and our achievements as a Federation over the, in during 2023. As I've mentioned, it's a key accountability moment. Uh, the governing board is responsible for governing the Federation and supported by the Secretary General and staff at IFLA during the year. But we also need to have the uh, annual accounts adopted by the General Assembly. They've already been reviewed by the governing board, but the General Assembly is responsible for approving them. The General Assembly also approves our annual report this year. And of course, it's also an important time to reflect and um, acknowledge the uh, people who have passed in the previous 12 months. 
And as I've already mentioned, it's another key function and activity is the making necessary changes to the statutes. The General Assembly is the only body that is able to make changes to IFLA statutes. So if we look at the next slide, it uh, in bold is the key functions that will be undertaken at next week's General Assembly. We'll be looking at the purpose and values of the Federation. We'll be amending some statutes, proposing um, statutes be amended, and we'll be asking our members to vote on that. And we'll also receive and approve the financial reports and accounts. So the Treasurer has a key role in actually submitting the financial reports to the General Assembly for approval. So um, some significant tasks in our governance as well. So I know that many of you have probably been to a General Assembly. Um, in the past, we've had some online, particularly during COVID, uh, they were totally online. Um, but normally we would have our uh, General Assembly at the World Library and Information Congress. This year, because we're not having a Congress, we've determined to have the uh, General Assembly um, online and it is being held on the 20th of June. And Sharon will explain uh, some of the reasons for why we're having it norm um, earlier than we normally would as well. So today's briefing, as I've said, is really about providing you some more information and context for the statute changes, but also some of the um, other decisions um, and uh, uh, agenda items at the General Assembly. And it is about equipping you to be able to make a decision on those particular proposals. Members uh, who will be able to vote are associations and some institutions in certain categories and honorary fellows. So it's important to note that personal affiliates and some uh, institution categories do not have voting rights. So you will know if you have voting rights because you would have already have received some correspondence from IFLA headquarters. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we move through uh, today's session. Today is also a good opportunity to ask questions using that question and answer functionality. Um, if you've got so something's not clear, um, do take today as an opportunity to seek some clarification. The General Assembly is, um, is only two hours, so um, it really is enabling us to optimise that period of time when we have the, uh, the General Assembly as well. We'll know that we've been successful uh, in today's session. If you go away feeling confident that you have enough information to enable you to vote next Thursday, and that you've also had the opportunity to ask the questions and receive answers as well. And of course, if you find it really helpful, you can also look back on the recording. As I've said, this session is being recorded, but also um, advise your colleagues about the opportunity to watch our recordings as well. And uh, as well. So that's setting the context for what we're going to cover today. And I'd now like to invite Sharon to tell us a little bit about the agenda and step us through some of the um, decisions that will need to be made. So over to you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Vicky. So what is actually on the agenda? Um, so if we can go to the next slide and let's look at that. Um, those of you who have attended before will be familiar. It's a, it's a tried and tested um, formula. Um, the opening, we obviously need to check that we have a, a, a quorum, that we have more than half the voting members there. Um, the adoption of the agenda, the minutes from last year. Um, we remember, as Vicky said, uh, those who passed during the, the last year. Uh, the president will then um, give a report on what she has been doing over the last 12 months. I will uh, talk about the annual report and some of the broader achievements of IFLA, the, the Federation, and many of the things that you have been doing as well. Um, the treasurer will present the accounts. Uh, we will have a moment to, to celebrate um, um, some individuals as well, a presentation of awards. And then we'll go to the formal part of the motions and the resolutions, where there will be two motions, one which will be to approve the holding of the next General Assembly in August 2025, when we very much hope that we will be holding a Congress. 
Um, and the reason, you know, Vicky said, why are we why are we doing it now in June? Well, in theory, the law is in the Netherlands that we should be holding this before June, but we can get your the General Assembly's permission to hold it um, at the very latest at the end of October. The reason we're doing it this year a little earlier is because um, of the change of the statutes and the request for the ambi status, which I'll come on to in a moment. So the mo the second um, set of motions will be around the amendment of the statutes. And then Vicky will give um, a closing address looking forward and the assembly will close. So it's quite a packed agenda for, um, for the General Assembly. Um, you can go to then the next slide if possible. So just to hi um, highlight really the key decision points that we'll be asking our members to vote on, which is the agenda, adopting the minutes, approving the holding of the next General Assembly in August 2025, the annual accounts to approve that Vicky's talked about, and approving, importantly, the necessary changes to enable us to apply for AMBI or charity status. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, so the what do we mean going towards an AMBI or charity status? Um, let me try and explain what the drivers for, for this are and to explain a little what um, an AMBI and charitable state is. I haven't seen anybody, any members um, from the Netherlands on this uh, webinar, but every time we have a member from the, web, the Netherlands, they will say things like, oh, well, we assumed you already were a, a charity or yes, it's a great idea. It's a very positive thing. Um, and I must say that when I joined a year ago, I naturally assumed that IFLA was a charity and it was a little bit of a surprise to find that we weren't. Um, so what of course we want for IFLA as we come up to our second century is we want a vibrant, inclusive international library field long into the future. So the plan to apply for a charitable status is really very much part of our wider sustainability plan for the future. And this is, this will enable us, we believe, and certainly make it much easier um, to build those partnerships. And I'll come on to the reasons in a moment. Um, but it's worth emphasizing again, that where does IFLA really add value? IFLA is the international, that global voice. And so that international aspect is really one of the most important um, the raison d'être, the reasons for 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 IFLA, and we believe that this this charity status will also help us strengthen that sustainability um, on the international frame. And you will see, I think, that when you look at our uh, new strategy, the draft strategy, that the international aspect features very strongly. So, what we're trying to do with the AMBI status, which makes things. Um, really much simpler in terms of partnering. And just to explain a little where we are with IFLA at the moment, we have, we may not be massive in terms of turnover, if you like, but we're remarkably complex for a small federation. Um, that we have IFLA, the federation, we have the holding sec parts of, um, uh, again, under Dutch law, we call them BV holdings, where we manage the Congress uh, the conferences so that we uh, minimize the risk. And then we have SIF, which is a, a small foundation within IFLA, um, which is what we use to manage the Arcadia grant, for example, and funding coming in. Quite separately, we have SIGL, which was set up back in 2017 when we got the legacy grant from, um, from the Gates Foundation. And the reason that SIGL was set up was precisely because IFLA couldn't take that money for tax reasons. Had we taken the money, it would have meant that um, quite a lot would have gone in, in taxes. And that for a funder is not an attractive proposition. So part of the reason uh, that we want to apply for the AMBI status is that it will make it much simpler for funders, whether in the Netherlands or internationally, to work with us and to give money to IFLA, which ensures that all of the money goes into um, into projects as opposed to and into the library field, as opposed to being swallowed up in tax. And it also means that our reporting, our 
um, the financials will be much more transparent because everything will be in IFLA and it will make it much clearer for everybody to see where the money is coming from, how it's being spent. And I think, you know, we're already making steps there, but I think it will be very, you know, really much better going into the future. So that's part of the reason for going for this um, uh, AMBI status, which if we can go to the next slide, um, and in case there are any Dutch members on um, the call, I'm not going to try and say this in Dutch, but essentially it's a public benefit institution. So in many countries, that's a charity. For those of you, um, I, I suspect we don't have many in the US, but in the US, that would be um, a 501c3. It's it's a not-for-profit. I think most countries will have some sort of structure which is which is similar. And um, this, I think, is a, a, a really um, it's a very exciting step. So what this means, as we say, it's going to be simpler to get those partnerships. Uh, it makes us a much more attractive fund, um, partner for funders because they know then that all of the money will go into benefiting um, global libraries. It does lock in higher requirements for reporting on activities and finance, which um, are, are not going to be a challenge because actually I think we're beginning to do that already. Last year, we we were um, we didn't do a sort of just summative accounts um, uh, publication. We shared everything. And this year, again, you're going to see that we're doing um, consolidated accounts so that everybody will be better able to see where our money is coming from, how we're using it. Um, so those requirements, I think we're very we're very comfortable with, and our tax advisors are telling us that yes, we're 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 meeting the criteria, and they're very confident we'll get it. Um, <clears throat> but the changes that we have to make are uh, there are a couple where we have slightly higher reporting requirements. There are some changes that we need to make um, to the way we're governed, which is where the statutes changes are. And Martin and Vicky will talk to you about those. And there's a a legal requirement where we have to have a clause which says that if if we were to close any remaining funding would go to another ambi or a, an international charity with similar goals and um, that the money would be going to support the global library field and going for the public benefit I hasten to add that um there are no plans to close we're, we're doing I think you know very well and, and and you'll see I think in the the account our reserves are very healthy we're moving on we hope to a new and an exciting stage and obviously the requirement is um, under AMBI is this idea of public benefit where 90% of our activity is for public benefit and I think one of the things that we've been trying to emphasize a lot more is that although we are a membership organization um, the benefits are not just accruing to our members, but to the communities that we serve. So a library isn't sitting in a bubble um, where you're just working. A library is a responsive, um, vibrant organization that is responding to the needs of, uh, of their local community. So we also, um, many of our volunteers are not members. So again, you know, we are, I think that public benefit and we've gone through everything with our advisors and they're very confident we'll get it. However, I think it is just worth emphasizing um, that we haven't yet applied, but we need to make the statutes change in order to apply. So it's not an absolute given, although we're relatively, um, <clears throat> relatively confident. Um, what this doesn't mean, and I think this is really important, IFLA is still your organization. No changes to our decision-making process. So members will still have the same voting rights. No additional reporting requirements for the committees. IFLA headquarters will handle all of that. And members are still the beating heart of IFLA. We, we exist to serve our members and the communities that you serve. So there are no changes there. And I think that's really important to, to note. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to now, I think, hand over to um, Vicky and Martin to go through the, the sort of legal and actual changes in those statutes. 
Thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you for taking us uh, through that, and particularly the AMBI status, because it is so important to our decision making next Thursday. So just a reminder, um, as we go through, if you've got any questions, please pop the questions into the question and answers. And we have a, um, a slide further up where we'll be able to pause and uh, respond to your questions. So now um, I'm going to um, take us through uh, the changes, or Martin's going to help us do that. So, of course, Martin's been, as parliamentarian, very much involved over the last six months in preparing us for these statute changes. Um, and how they are represented on the screen is in blue is the changed text um, that is proposed and then an explanation below it of what the statute change is. So, Martin, this one, so Article 2.2c, is really about um, broadening the purpose of IFLA. Is that right? It, that's right. Um, although, in reality, it reflects what IFLA does at the moment. Uh, Sharon emphasised the, um, the, the, the importance that we can demonstrate that 90% of IFLA's work is for the public benefit. And so this um, expands the phrasing on this purpose to include the library information organizations and communities they serve, not just members. But this really reflects um, the change of the uh, purposes given in uh, 2.2 A and B, which emphasize that whilst we are a membership organization, the benefits of the work of the organization cover the communities and are fully for the public benefit. And by um, putting it in full in the statutes, it demonstrates um, to the tax offices that IFLA is working for the public benefit uh, for at least 90% of its activity. Okay. So thank you very much. And of course, just a reminder, this, the, um, the existing statutes and rules of procedure are on our website. So you can have a look back just to, to see how this article sits in the context of art, other articles as well. So we go to the next slide. One of the other changes that's proposed is Article 14.5. Um, and that's really around um, delegations and um, assets, isn't it, Martin? Do you want to explain what this one's about for us? That's right. Um, under Dutch law, um, the uh, trustees, in this case the governing board, um, have to work for um, the benefit of the organisation and it's important that they're not to make, to, able to make decisions uh, to use the institution's assets as if they were their own. And so by adding this, it really emphasises that, um, uh, that criteria. It's again, it's the way the governing board works now anyway, but by placing it firmly within the statutes, it demonstrates how it is meeting the criteria for ANBI status. And so when the governing board delegates decision making, which it does as part of its day to day work, it, it, it clearly emphasizes that no single person can dispose of the assets as if they're their own, and it has to be um, a group and corporate decision making. Really, it's strengthening governance for us and also meeting and complying with the Dutch law as well. Um, so 15.3 is in many ways related to Article 14.5. Um, do you want to just explain what that one's about, please? Certainly, it, it is the same principle, um, but this is in a very specific circumstance. The article as a whole deals what happens if one or more of the governing board are not able to carry out their role for any any reason, which could be illness, it could be a range of reasons. Um, and it's a particular circumstance that if the whole of the governing board is unable to, um, to carry out their roles, and in this case, the General Assembly, which is the, the higher decision-making body, it's the members who said it's the highest decision-making body, they can identify uh, three individuals to temporarily take charge until the governing board is able to carry out its role again. In our previous statutes, this was one individual, but again, to make sure that no one individual can make that decision to dispose or use institutions assets, it means that that's been increased to three. But this is a very extreme circumstance, but again, by placing it clearly in the uh, statutes, it demonstrates that IFLA does meet the criteria for ADBI status. In a way, it gives our members assurance as well around the governance of our assets as well, yes. so, which is good. 
So the next change is to Article 23.2, and I guess uh, immediately we can see that this is a totally new article because it's all in blue, um, and I think also relates back to one of uh, Sharon's comments earlier. Um, can you explain this one as well then, Martin, please? Yes, it, it is a completely uh, new article, but actually it follows the spirit of the uh, um, existing statute as well. But it does ex spell out what would happen um, uh, should the uh, federation be uh, dissolved to make sure it does fit clearly again within the AMBI, uh, AMBI regulations. So it's, it's, it specifies that if there are the assets that are, are left um, when... Uh, or if IFLA is dissolved, they are passed to either um, a similar public benefit or a similar ANBI organization with a similar purpose uh, as a Dutch body, or if it's to be transferred to a foreign body institution, it again, uh, that body must uh, demonstrate that it is at least 90% focused on the public benefit. But it maintains the uh, requirement that um, uh, if and when IFLA is dissolved, uh, the assets are used for a similar purpose. So they are used for the same purpose that they were raised in the first, the assets were raised in the first place. So it continues the uh, spirit of our present statute, but defines it in a way that meets anti status. I guess, you know, it's um, it's statutes are about being able to respond to any circumstance that may come up in the future. Um, but as Sharon said, we're not anticipating uh, liquidating or winding IFLA up. Um, and we've just, we're about to celebrate our first centenary and look forward to a second centenary as well. Um, so we move to the next article, which is 15.4 team, which is more around some of our membership and, and roles within the uh, Federation. Um, would you like to take us through this one, please, Martin? Yes, it, this is not um, directly related to Abbey State. It's an issue that arose over the past few years. And so it's important to have it, this clarified in our statutes because it does reflect Dutch law. Um, it's slightly complicated, so I'll, I'll go through it in, in stages. But in essence, the General Assembly, um, as the, the highest uh, uh, decision-making body and its members, um, does have the power to suspend or dismiss any member of the governing board if, it's act, if that member's acting contrary or against the statutes or purposes of the Federation. And it has to have that power, so it has confidence in the governing board and what the governing board is doing. But Dutch law also specifies that those who elect um, a, a member of the governing board uh, are able to dismiss that, that person. And whilst most of the governing board are elected directly for members, there are three roles, the chair of the professional council, the chair of the regional council, and the chair of the MLAS, which is the unit that represents the interests of national association members. They elect them directly um, and so it's much more limited electorate and they are members of the governing board because they hold those roles. So what this does is this uh, statute now clarifies that those, uh, the electors of those three roles can, dis can dismiss them from that role as chair. And because of that, they would then cease to be a governing board member. And the, um, uh, but it does reflect the law that, as I say, that the electors of each of those roles can actually dismiss them if they're not carrying out the role that they should be doing. A new chair will be elected in each of those cases and that person would then step into their role as the governing board member. So it's to reflect those, the two rights there, if you like, of um, both the members as a whole and the electors, those three specific posts. Thank you. So essentially it's a principle, whoever elects has the um, delegation to dismiss in a way. Exactly, exactly. Okay, and I think the next one is sort of related to this one. Oh, no, that's it. That is all our, our all our statutes. So that's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, and thank you for taking us through and helping us to explain those. So um, also, I can see there's a couple of questions that have come through. Um, so Sharon, we might just look at them. Well, we'll deal with the questions when we get to them. But um, first, maybe if you just take us through the convening notice, the documentation and the motions, and then we'll come to the questions. Okay, um, we can do questions afterwards then. Fine. So um, it, 
you know, some of these you might want to just obviously look at in more detail yourselves, and you will be able to find all of these documents on the website. And what we have, and um, this is, you know, stating stating the obvious, I suppose, that we've obviously got the Dutch version and a translation into English. The one that stands up in court, if you like, is the Dutch version. That is the legal document. Um, so our Dutch members are at an advantage here, but we think the translation is, um, it's, it, it, you know, is a is a pretty good one. So I, I think we're pretty confident that uh, you'll get a very accurate view of um, of what the uh, uh, what the changes are. So do please look. You will be able to see the both the Dutch and the English version in track change. So you can see exactly where we've changed it. And um, you will also be able to see the clean version. So what it will look like in the future. Okay. And then on to the next one. Um, and to look at the actual motions then. So these are the, the motions, the kind of legal motions, if you like, which is to amend the Articles of Association of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions in conformity with the draft deed of amendment prepared by Van der Stapp, um, which is our, our, our notary. So of course we've been doing all of this with the notary and with our tax advisors to make sure that everything is, is appropriate and compliant. And so that will be um, one of the motions. And the second one um, is to, if you like, appoint each member of the governing board and each candidate, civil law, notary, paralegal and secretary. So essentially the members of the governing board, um, the notary um, staff uh, to actually um, hold it and submit um, and, and formally change the uh, the amendments. So the, the statute. So these are the, if you like, the two legal motions that we, we need to go. So essentially what that means is approving the revised versions and approving the process to submit. So that I hope is, is, is clearer because when you read the actual motions, they can look a bit legalistic and particularly uh, if English is not your first language. Okay, so the next slide, also on the agenda. So I think we've probably gone through this already, but just to remind you that we'll have the annual report and the um, annual accounts. What we are doing this year is um, having a higher level of detail than in previous years. And we think that that is in line with good practice and it's our commitment to transparency. So the, what we're doing this year is we're, we're doing um, what we're calling consolidated accounts. So you'll see, you will see everything. Uh, and, and I personally, and I know um, Vicky uh, agrees, we think that it's really important to give our members as much information as we possibly can. Um, those accounts were endorsed at a meeting in May. And I think just the key headlines is that uh, the audit was an unqualified audit. What that means is that it's a good audit. There are no, no causes for concern. The auditors found nothing untoward, nothing inappropriate. Money was spent appropriately. Everything was, was, was in order. Our processes, control measures were good. Um, they also uh, established that we have a healthy level of reserves. And so that means that we're in a, you know, a good position going forward. But of course, what we are looking at, and this is one of the drivers for applying for the AMBI status, is that we are going to have a, a, a much stronger focus on longer term financial sustainability. And that really is, is one of the, the key drivers of why we're going for the AMBI status. So yes, it's a uh, more detail, more information, uh, a clean audit, an unqualified audit, but we need to look for the to the future. <clears throat> okay, next slide. So uh, the other, um, everything we'll be asking you to agree to, of course, is, as I've already said, is holding um, the General Assembly in 2025 in August, when we hope very much that we will be um, at the Congress in, in Kazakhstan. Um, legally, we need to hold the General um, Assembly. We have to get your agreement if we want to hold it after the 30th of June, as I've already said, and we're very much hoping we can do it uh, to coincide, as I say, with the Congress next year. So how can you participate? Well, 
we would love to see some of you in our office in person in The Hague, but we realize that that's a, a, a difficult ask for many people. And I'm hoping that our Dutch members at least will, will turn out in force. Um, but it is a hybrid uh, General Assembly. Um, but if you are in the Netherlands between one o'clock and three o'clock uh, Central European summer time, you are very, very welcome. Please let us know. But otherwise voting, we'll be using the usual Lumi um, uh, platform. So you will be able to vote online and um, Helen will be sending all of the links to enable you to do that. We will also, uh, you'll also be able to ask questions, which we will read out in the room and we'll have people monitoring the questions, which we will answer. Uh, others can follow using the um, live stream on IFLA's YouTube channel. And uh, you can vote by proxy if the timing doesn't work for you. Although we've tried to pick a time that most of the world can, um, can access, uh, even if it's very early or very late, um, it, it's still going to be difficult for some people. So you can use a proxy um, for your voting. That's not a problem. Okay. And then I think we are on to the questions. So we've got some in the q and I can see. Um, <clears throat> so, um, got two from Hella. Uh, show, uh, do you want me to start on the questions, Vicky, and then add, or do you want um, to take? I'm, I'm up to you. Perhaps might um, I might just say to um, Winston uh, Roberts, uh, very kindly has been reading the fine print for us, so he did pick up an error in our slides. Um, it, it is, of course, as you pointed out, Winston, the professional council and the regional council. So thank you for that. We'll uh, we will correct that. Um, so perhaps um, Sharon, maybe if I direct the first question to you uh, from Hella, is okay. uh, why didn't Ifla apply for the AMBI status earlier if this is so important to us? um as well okay um i i mean i've only been here a, a year so i don't know historically but i would imagine that it was quite simply the federation structure worked for ifla um i i came in and i think vicky came in and we sort of you know took on our roles around, around the same time and we were looking at how we could build that financial sustainability that I, I think perhaps we haven't focused on sufficiently in the previous years. Um, and that if we want to take that more global view, if you like, uh, that it just made sense to have that charitable status. So I think it's just the world changes, IFLA's changed. I think it's also an acknowledgement that, um, you know, perhaps the work that we're doing, which is much broader, some of the work we're doing around the um, the advocacy, some of the work around, you know, linking our work so strongly to the sustainable development goals. I think it was just one of those things that made made a lot of sense. And I confess also, I just came in and when the finances were presented to me on the first day or the first week, I was just surprised at how how complicated they were, that we got little bits of different bodies and different entities here and there. And I, I think I probably just asked the question, why? Why are we doing it like this? And then the explanation. So I suspect it's just one of those things, which is, um, you know, it was just the right time and um, and, and, the, and the right processes and the past, uh, the Federation served our needs. Uh, the world's changing and we we move on. And this, um, you know, having having done quite a lot of work around this now and thinking about it and, and discussed with everybody and researched it, we think this is probably a sensible thing to do. Um, I think, does that answer, I think, I hope that answers your question, Hella? Yeah, I think that's a good answer, Sharon. I think too, you know, we've got this uh, strong focus on financial sustainability, <laughs> and through our discussions, we've been able to identify that AMBI status is an opportunity. It is an option for IFLA to to consider. I might throw the second question from Hella to you, Martin, um, okay. and it's in relation to the dismissal of, of MLAS members, and I think the question would also apply to the Professional Council and the Regional Council. So Hella's um, asking, you know, I, essentially I'm thinking, can the GB dismiss the, cha the chair? But, I, you know, that I guess is the premise of what, what this particular statute change is about. So would you like to respond to that one? Certainly. Um... There's two parts to the question, and the first part is, uh, if MLAS members dismiss the chair, this person is no, automatically no longer a member of the GB. That's correct. 
on that. Now, for the second question, the statutes don't explicitly cover this uh, potential situation simply because the statutes can't cover um, absolutely every possible permutation or every possible circumstance. But in this case, my advice would be that it does um, remove that person from being chair of MLAS because the governing board is a higher body than the than MLAS. What I think would happen in reality is that um, it would be surprising if MLAs themselves weren't concerned that their chair was not carrying out that role as well. Um, and so um, I think uh, it's it, it's um, a, a likely rare circumstance, but my advice to the governing board will be um, if the governing board dismisses the chair because somebody doesn't carry out their role as a governing board member, they would also cease to be chair of MLAS. Um, but that's advice because it's not specifically in the statutes, um, uh, uh, as I say, because not every single circumstance can be uh, contained in the statutes. But I hope that's helpful. Thank you. So I might also then, um, um, well, let me see, just go then to um, back to you, Sharon, there's another question in relation to the AMBI status from Randa um, in relation to would it be possible for regional divisions to draft their own fundraising activities um, as well? So um, a very big feature of uh, our new draft strategy uh, is very much around partnerships. And um, Stephen, Stephen Weiber and I have been working uh, very closely on, on this. So one of the pushes there is going to be precisely to work with regions and our regional offices and obviously um, involving the regional divisions to really support that. Uh, and I guess I want to really emphasize that when we talk about partnerships and sustainability, what we are talking about is partnerships and sustainability in the global library field. What we are absolutely not talking about is, um, if you like, competing with our, our members around the world. This will be to look at how we support you in, in getting some of those global partnerships. And we think the AMBI status will certainly help us do that. So we have some quite big plans. Um, if you come to Brisbane, I think we'll be talking about them um, a little bit more then. Um, but certainly, I think that that, that will be a, a really key part. So, you know, nothing is, I mean, everything is possible in a sense. You're, you know, members can do everything. But I hope that what we will be doing is giving a lot more support and help to uh, the different groups. Um, and, and also, we see it as a really positive way of getting the regional divisions and the, um, the regional committees and the professional council to sort of work together and bringing in, if you like, some of that expertise and the geographical focus. So it, it's, a, uh, it's a sort of, a, a, in a sense, I probably kind of need about an hour and a, and a paper to, to really explain this, but do watch this space and we will be talking a lot more about partnerships um, in the coming months. Thanks, Sharon. Um, there's also a question that was asked and, and answered, but I think it's useful just for us to say. Um, so there's a question from Louis from Silop in the UK, who's unable to make the General Assembly because of another uh, prior arrangement, just asking around proxy. So if you are a registered member, unable to join live, you can register to vote and indicate who you would like to give your proxy to. So um, that is a possibility and that is explained in the documentation you'll receive as well. So I'm um, sorry you can't join us, Louis, but um, it, it's, it is important to vote. So it's great that you're, you're looking at that option as well. Um, so I think we've answered all the questions that we've received to date. So we might just go back to go on with the slides. And I guess this is the timeline and the roadmap that we have. Um, we started back in 5th of June with registrations for the General Assembly opening. This week, we've had three town halls um, that we, similar to today's, where we've um, outlined the, the General Assembly, the statute change and what will occur at the General Assembly. These have been recorded. So um, if you want to go back, and look at them again, that option is available. So the 18th of June, which is Tuesday, is when registrations close. So it's really important that you register if you are a member. 
and following your registration, then the voting credentials will be sent to members as well. And then most importantly, um, on the 20th of June, so um, next Thursday, is the General Assembly. So um, it's um, less than a week away now. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, do just um, send the questions through to ifla at ifla.org and Sharon or one of the team will be able to respond to you. I'll just check the questions just to see if any more questions have come. It doesn't look like it. I'll just check the chat. Um, no, all good. Okay. So, um, so we, yes, we look forward to seeing you online on the 20th of June. Um, I will be joining the General Assembly and chairing the General Assembly from Brisbane. Uh, so we're really um, testing out the technology uh, in 2024. And we'll also have, of course, have the team and, and um, Martin as our parliamentarian in The Hague as well. So I do awesome. hope that you join us. So having you online, I can't let the opportunity pass without also telling you and reminding you about the IFLA Information Futures Summit, which will be held here in Brisbane uh, the 30th of September to the 3rd of October. Here is the uh, the website. Uh, you can um, The URL is 2024.ifla.org. And as you can see there, the early bird deadline has been extended to the 24th of June. So this is a great photograph of the central business district of Brisbane, uh, which is where the uh, summit will be held. Uh, the convention centre is just on the left of the screen there. And you can see it's a five minute walk across to the central business district, as well as our parklands um, as well. So a very beautiful time to visit. Uh, spring in Brisbane with uh, fantastic weather as well. But of course, uh, in addition to being a great location, we also have a fantastic program planned. And I do encourage you to check out the speakers tab on the website. We've been adding more speakers this week and there'll be more speakers being added in the coming weeks as well. The program is constantly being updated um, and, uh, you know, I'm quite excited about the program. We'll be trying some different things uh, and, and looking at how we can ensure that we have a really interactive and engaged summit and having opportunities for delegates to engage with the speakers. Um, and, of course, this year we're doing the Willick Review and this all helps us contribute to some of those decisions as well. Uh, yes, Louis, um, we're very excited that Joe Cornish is coming, so, so thank you as well. So um, do, do take a look at our, um, our website, and I do hope to see you in Brisbane, Australia, in September as well. So before we go, Sharon, any final words that you'd like to offer? No, just really um, thank you all very much for joining and I hope it's useful and it's great to get get feedback from this. Um, and again, I would just say, please do come if you can to Brisbane. I know that for many in Europe, it's quite a long way away, but just think of how um, far our Australian colleagues and New Zealand colleagues have to travel when the Congress is in Europe. I think it'll be very exciting. It will be a real opportunity to help shape the future of, of IFLA. So, um, you know, Lewis, just because Joe's coming doesn't prevent you from coming as well. We do allow a little personal formalization. So I hope to see many of you there. Um, uh, and I hope to see many of you as well, obviously, online next um, next Thursday when we have the General Assembly, because um, that tends to be quite a formal scripted event. So this is a bit more relaxed. I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much Sharon and thank you Martin for uh, attending today and also taking us through the statutes yeah. and also the work that you've done over the last six months to enable us to present them to our members as well so thank you. Yeah.